want to thank you guys for coming out. <laughs> it was a lot quieter in my head. Did not relax me at all. Okay. Um, um, wow, okay, Professor McWilliams. What a rock star. She is the Associate Professor of Politics at Pomona College, where she has won the Wig Award for Excellent Teaching twice, which is the highest honor that we bestow our professors uh, for teaching at Pomona. She recently wrote a book called Traveling Back Toward a Global Political Theory, which was just published last year. You guys should all read it. Um, she did not tell me to say that either. That was me. Um, she has co-edited edited many books, uh, most recently, The Best Kind of College, An Insider's Guide to America's Selective Liberal Arts Colleges, which was also co-edited by our very own Professor John Seary of the Politics Department. That will be published very soon, so keep your eyes up for that. Um, speaking of being published, Professor McWilliams has been in a number of publications, such as The Boston Review, Bust, Front Row Republic, sorry, Front Porch Republic, um, Perspectives on Political Science, Political Science Quarterly, Review of Politics, Star Ledger, and so much more. You guys should see her CV, it's a novel in itself. <laughs> Very impressive. Uh, she received her Master's and PhD in Politics at Princeton University, where she also received the Association of Princeton Graduate Alumni University Teaching. And just recently, she doesn't stop, she just won two awards last year, where she won the Graves Award for the hum in the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So, two very big awards. Um, and last but not least, she lives in Claremont, uh, just down the street with her husband and two beautiful young children. And they have a parrot, a chicken, and a tarantula. So, it's a very fun house, I can guarantee you that. So, I know you guys didn't all come here to sit in this crowded room and listen to me blab on. So, without further ado, I ask you, I invite you to give a warm, warm welcome to THE Professor Susan McWilliams. delivered to the Athenian Assembly 2,414 years ago. Many of you, I hope, know that story already, um, but let me remind you how it goes. Uh, Socrates, having been accused by his fellow citizens of corrupting the youth and introducing new gods into the city, uh, stands in front of the assembly and delivers a defense that is less of himself than it is of the philosophic enterprise writ large. Uh, in making that defense, a defense of the search for truth, Socrates issues a devastating critique of the ruthlessness and the thoughtless presumption of everyday Athenian life. He all but dares his fellows to convict him, and they do. He all but dares to them to sentence him to death, they do that too, proving, among other things, that Socrates wasn't exactly barking up the wrong tree when he described Athenians as ruthless and thoughtlessly presumptive. Now, even if you haven't read Plato's Apology, the text through which most of us have encountered Socrates' last lecture, you will have heard some of Socrates' best lines from it. Line 21D, I know that I know nothing. Line 38A, the unexamined life is not worth living. Line 42A, I go to die and you to live. But which of us goes to the better a lot is known to none but God. 2,414 years later, the best philosophers among us are no better than Echoes of Socrates in his last lecture. Well, there are only two other last lectures I know of that hold a candle to Socrates. Uh, one of them, of course, is that last lecture depicted in another storied classic of Western civilization. I'm speaking, of course, of the 1990s cult stoner film, Half-Baked. <laughs> Many of you, I hope, know that story already, too, uh, but let me remind you how it goes. In the course of that great drama, and it is a really great drama, uh, a young gentleman named Scarface, played by a young Guillermo Diaz, um, decides to quit his burger-flipping, burger-joint job in order to do the more noble and dignified work of selling marijuana. Unable to take one more second 
of the regular humiliations of work at His Royal Beefiness, which, I swear to you, is the name of his place of employment, His Royal Beefiness. Scarface grabs the cashier's microphone and delivers the following last lecture, which I shall perform for you in its entirety. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. You're cool. Fuck you. I'm out. <laughs> I love both of those last lectures so much, <laughs> so much, that for months I sat at my desk, figuring that all I needed to do to write a lovable last lecture of my own would be to channel the spirits of Socrates and Scarface. And so for months, I channeled, and I channeled, and I channeled. I read Plato, watched Half Baked. Read Plato again watch Half Baked again. Red Plato while watching Half Baked, which is a really kind of interesting experience. I highly recommend it. Um, and then I channeled some more. And for all that channeling, uh, and all that watching, all that reading, each draft of my last lecture came out worse than the one before it. Stilted, pretentious, false, dumb, annoying, blah. Here's the thing. I've been writing lectures for almost half my life. I've always been able to sit down and with the smallest hint of an idea, muck my way into something I like, usually in a matter of hours. I don't know how to do much, but I know how to write a goddamn lecture. At least I thought I knew how to write a lecture, but the process of writing this last lecture got so bad uh, that I think I came to understand what sudden impotence in the bedroom must feel like to men. <laughs> this has never happened to me before. <laughs> that to my husband, you have to understand, this has never happened to me. <laughs> Yesterday, by the way, while I was sort of going through those lines, my husband heard me from the other room and said, what are you saying about me and the evidence that you're going to say in that last lecture? <laughs> this has never happened to me before. <laughs> so Sunday uh, had me showing up at Professor Eisenstadt's house, uninvited, holding a bottle of wine and demanding last lecture ideas. Uh, we drank the bottle and she gave me lots of ideas. I came home, looked to Socrates and Scarface for one final burst of inspiration, and nothing, nothing. So Monday, to mix it up, um, I showed up at Professor Eisenstadt's house, uninvited, <laughs> holding a bottle of wine, and demanding last lecture ideas. We drank that bottle, and she gave me lots of ideas. Um, in fact, uh, Una basically wrote for her own entire last lecture over the course of our conversation, uh, which only added to my sense of humiliation and impotence when I returned to my desk and nothing. Um, side note to mortar borders, you can ask Una to do one of these lectures. She's ready. <laughs> uh, by that point, it was Monday night, and I was in a panic. Um, I had a class that evening. Uh, and afterward, um, I commandeered one of my students. Um, I demanded that he come into my office. I told him, this has never happened to me before. What am I supposed to do? Uh, maybe, he suggested, you could write a last lecture about how hard it was for you to write this last lecture. No, I said. <laughs> that would never work. Uh, it's just too, you know, Please, I begged him, I, I really begged him, please, just tell me what the students want to hear in the last lecture. I will say it. Uh, he looked me in the eye, he didn't miss a beat. Truth, he said, we want to hear the truth. Um, after that, I went home and wrote another terrible last lecture. This one, I think, the worst of all. Um, but I woke up in the morning, yesterday morning, and thought, I have students who seek truth. Um, I have students who sit in my office at 10 o'clock on a Monday night and give me great ideas, even if I don't really realize they're great ideas at first. I have students who listen to my ideas in turn. I have students who like to listen to lectures over dinner on a Wednesday. Uh, I have students who are friends. I have colleagues who are friends. I have colleagues who drink wine and talk with me about things that really matter. Um, every day, if I want, I get to talk about things that really matter with smart and interesting people who themselves want to matter. I am surrounded by people who want more out of life than mere life. 
They want what Aristotle describes as the good life. And even more than that, they want to use their lives to do good. Thus thinking. I went to my desk and typed out a sentence, was standing out, not really thinking about what I was doing, um, and the sentence was this. I never want to stop teaching at Pomona College. I looked at that sentence, and then I realized where I had been going wrong. Socrates and Scarface delivered great last lectures, yes. Those last lectures share two qualities that many last lectures do. Uh, first, they're marked by the spirit of liberation that attends speech suddenly unintimidated by the powers that be. Second, they're marked by shades of mortality, by the fact that the liberations of the lecture, the calling it like it is in those places to those powers, are made possible only by severing ties to those places and those powers, by leaving, by becoming dead to whatever particular place, in Socrates' case, by dying. For Socrates and Scarface, neither of whom had ever said what he really thought in so public a venue, the liberation must have been exhilarating. In the moment when you finally get the chance or the courage to say a fuck you that you've thought about saying for so long, one really feels marvelously alive. Uh, but such a discreet, culminating, life-affirming moment of liberation isn't imaginable to me. Uh, at least not within this context at Pomona College. For at Pomona, I get to say what I really think every day. Uh, since the moment I arrived here, including, by the way, in the years before I had tenure, I've been made to feel comfortable here by my students, by my fellow professors, even by the administration, in saying what I think. Uh, even when saying what I think has put me with, at, at odds with the powers that be. Uh, I'm liberated here. Uh, and have been so since my arrival. I remember, in fact, um, saying to a colleague during my first semester at Pomona, um, I feel like an animal who has uh, raised in a zoo, who's been, finally been returned to my natural habitat. It's a little strange at first, this freedom, but I think I like it. Uh, it's amazing that they kept me around. Uh, my experience of this liberal arts college harks back to the original meaning of the term liberal arts which is that the purpose of the liberal arts is to teach people and cultivate in them the arts of liberty. Oh, so if for me, there can be no special, exhilarating liberation attendant to the fantasy of giving a last lecture. All that's left for me in the models of Socrates and Scarface is the shade of mortality. The grief of the loss that would envelop me in leaving this place, and I don't want to leave this place. More to board? Thank you for the invitation, but I do not want to play your game. <laughs> uh, to play out the moment when my own imminent decrepitude or my own imminent death, probably from some horrible terminal disease, forces me off the lectern. Um, if that's the context, why would I want to channel Socrates and Scarface? How could I channel Socrates and Scarface? I still love their last lectures, but the spirit of such a last lecture will never be my own. Not now, not here. When I think about Pomona College, I don't want to say fuck you to Pomona College. I want to say thank you to Pomona College. I want to protect Pomona College. Well, to protect the best things about Pomona College anyway. Uh, in a world where Pomona College and what we do and how we do it and why we do it are under constant and serious attack from a multitude of prevailing forces and well-heeled powers. Power so well healed that they could literally buy and sell this entire place in a day. We like to pretend we're rich here, but we're rich only by comparison to other colleges. We are not rich compared to the forces and powers and monies in the world. If I want to say, uh, fuck you, or to issue a devastating critique of the powers that be, it's on behalf of Pomona College. On behalf of all small liberal arts colleges, um, because the death of the small liberal arts college, I think, really does seem imminent. Uh, yesterday, in fact, uh, in the journal Inside Higher Ed, um, the president emeritus of Beloit College, Victor Farrell Jr., wrote what is effectively an obituary for the small liberal arts college. Now, Farrell, you should know, wrote a book about three years ago. It was titled Liberal Arts at the Brink. Uh, in which he reported lots of things, like the fact that the student demand for liberal arts courses and majors, the humanities, the social sciences, the physical sciences, which is to say, all of the courses and majors at Pomona, 
was rapidly declining and being replaced by demand for vocational, directly career-related courses and majors. Uh, Farrell wrote yesterday, he said, you know, looking back on, you know, those kinds of facts and the assessment I made three years ago, yesterday he said, back then, I thought the future of the liberal arts education was bleak, but not hopeless. Now I believe I was too optimistic. <laughs> yesterday, Farrell described a landscape, our landscape, in which liberal arts colleges are engaged in massive and systematic self-destruction, spending money on frivolous amenities designed to look good in brochures while eviscerating the faculty positions and academic departments that are at their intellectual and institutional core. Uh, he talks, too, about the powerful national voices that publicly deride the liberal arts, usually without any contestation. Uh, many of those voices, including that of President Obama's, are the inegalitarian and hypocritical voices of powerful people who got powerful because they received a stellar liberal arts education, but now act like their big vocabularies and considered ideas about justice and the common good were picked up in the womb. <laughs> so did you hear this? President Obama said this not too long ago. I promise you, he said, that folks can make a lot more potentially with skilled manufacturing or the trades than they might with an art history degree. Now I want you to note here that despite President Obama's priorities for the rest of us, he spends a lot of money to send his own daughters to one of the few high schools in the country that champions liberal arts education and which has, unlike just about any other high school in the country, a full multi-course curriculum in, take a guess, art history. <laughs> Anytime, by the way, that President Obama uses the word folks, pick up your ears. He's about to say something really annoying. <laughs> Farrell notes that in, in response to that kind of talk, so often so baldly hypocritical, from leaders in politics and business and even education, liberal arts college administrators, and professors, and graduates, and students have mostly been silent. We're not in public saying what we think. Farrell concluded his article yesterday with these lines. Liberal arts are over the brink. Some liberal arts colleges will fail or be forced to sell out to for-profit institutions. Some already have. Many will quietly morph into vocational trainers. A handful of the wealthiest colleges, probably fewer than 50, educating less than one half of 1% of US college students may survive. They will, however, no longer play a central role in educating Americans. Rather, they will become elite boutiques, romantic remnants of the past, like British roadsters and vinyl phonograph records. Well, it doesn't take a daring mind to predict uh, that Pomona College, wealthy as we are here, relatively Wealthy, is going to be one of those few colleges that may survive to school young people in the liberal arts for another generation. At a place like Pomona, in fact, it can sometimes seem like the liberal arts have never been stronger. The number of students who apply to go here is higher than ever. The acceptance rate at 12.1% is at an all-time low. Our endowment hovers at or above a million dollars a student. Think about that, a million dollars for everyone in here. <laughs> a lot more people too. Uh, we have not just a need blind admission policy, but also a no loan financial aid policy. Virtually all our classes are taught by tenure track faculty uh, who are well compensated and have a significant say in the governance of the institution. Our administrators and trustees repeatedly reaffirm their commitment to the liberal arts. And there's no situation I can foresee in which Pomona adds some kind of narrowly tailored vocational degree program to its roster. There will never be, at least not in the near future, a Pomona School of Pharmacy. Uh, nobody would dare talk of eliminating a department like religious studies here. Uh, in fact, courses in religious studies here are often oversubscribed. So last night, I'm thinking about all this, and I call my friend Jeff, uh, my curmudgeonly friend Jeff, um, and Jeff teaches in the liberal arts at a school uh, that's near here, um, but not as well situated as Pomona in all these regards. It's much more representative of small liberal arts colleges around the country. So I told him about the exercise of this last lecture. Uh, I said, oh, and he said, what? You're supposed to do what? 
are you supposed to pretend you're dying? <laughs> then he said the best thing. He said, is this an honor or is this a hint? <laughs> <laughs> we laughed about that too. Uh, but then we're laughing and all of a sudden, I don't really still know how it happened, he like went into this wild, uh, mind-blowing rage. This is what he said. I actually was at the computer, and this is almost word for word what he said. <laughs> Screw those mortarboard people, whoever they are. <laughs> you need to tell those cute little sage dudes, or whatever they call them, <laughs> that while they're having you pretend your precious career at a pre as a precious professor at a precious school is ending, that there are actual liberal arts professors your age who really will be giving their last lecture this semester because their jobs are being cut because there were never tenure tracked in the first place, because politics department are being traded in for accounting departments, and because for most of us, there's a real battle that's going on out here, and last lecturing isn't a game, it's life. Well, we use the word privilege a lot at Pomona, uh, and it's no news to any of you that going to Pomona College is a great privilege. Um, a privilege, I want to remind you, that in large measure can be chalked up to your pure dumb luck. Um, even though sometimes people call you things like the best and the brightest by virtue of the fact that you're here in this precious place, you all know that that's a lie. <laughs> you all know that there are many people your own age, some of whom you know, most of whom you don't, who are better and brighter than you are, and who do not merely because of the accidents of fortune and birth and circumstance over which none of us have any control, who do not and will not go to a college like this one, will not go to college at all. Our lives at Pomona College are unquestionably lives of luxury, luxury with which we have been entrusted but have not entirely earned. Now, privilege and luxury, are fraught concepts for people who have democratic commitments and aspirations, as I think almost all of us in this room do. Um, you can also see like the endless anxieties about privilege in, among the chattering class since the idea of check your privilege has sort of, you know, come into the uh, public discourse in the last couple of years, right? Um, uh, there's a rightful temptation uh, for we small-D Democrats to treat any kind of privilege or luxury as something suspect, as something potentially unnecessary or shameful, as something that may well be corrosive to the common good. I say it's a rightful temptation because it's so often true. Um, we are surrounded in this society by privileges and luxuries. Things like Humvee limos at prom, gated communities, and Botox, that are in fact suspect, unnecessary, shameful, and corrosive to the common good. Uh, in that sense, it never hurts to, as the saying goes, check your privilege. I'll subscribe to the popular wisdom this far by saying, it is important to check the privilege that a Pomona College education affords you. We need to be clear. Just as many people have recognized a dangerous and growing economic divide between the one percenters and the rest of the population, there is a dangerous and growing educational divide between those who have access to the liberal arts and those who do not. Without question, these economic and educational divides are not unrelated, and not just because tuition at liberal arts colleges can be expensive. Even at a school like this one that makes great efforts to level the playing field financially for our applicants, our student body comes disproportionately from the world's wealthiest families. That's most of your families. Uh, despite our wishes to the contrary, our work often reinforces rather than reduces the nation's increasingly two-tier politics. And yet, the kind of privilege that a Pomona College education affords you is privilege of a different kind than that bestowed by riding in a Humvee limo to prom, moving into a gated community, or Botoxing your armpits. A practice which, in its creepy prevalence, and it is creepily prevalent, seems to me an adequate justification for revolution or apocalypse, no more explanation needed. Uh, those kinds of privilege, uh, the Botoxing, the Humvee, the gated community, are superficial. As such, they can only reproduce and amplify the ruthless powers of the culture, its inequalities, its exclusions, its narcissistic inclinations and encouragements. 
the luxury of an education at a place like Pomona is a different kind of luxury altogether. For although your Pomona degree will give you access to the positions of power and influence and leadership at the center of, the, of this culture, which to be fair, you could choose to use to reproduce and amplify the ruthless powers that be. Your Pomona education also supplies you with ways of thinking and writing and speaking and acting that are deeply counter-cultural. Being a liberal arts college graduate makes you, given the powers and forces of the day, part of an endangered species, part of a threatened minority. And a liberal arts education schools you in articulate, articulately, how can you say articulately, as a point and mess up the pronunciation. <laughs> That's a big liberal arts college kind of question for you. In articulately questioning or engaging or resisting all those who would tell you, this is how it is. Um, or uh, the poet W.H. Auden put it, all those people who tell you, what a great poetic phrase, this rock is Eden, shipwreck here. In your lives, you will have the luxury of being able, if you want, to be in the conventional powers, but not of them. Uh, for the record, for their part, the ancient Greeks can't little kill theorist can't go 10 minutes without bringing the ancient Greeks back in. For their part, the ancient Greeks thought that the very few people who happened by accident, by circumstance, to come in to inhabit that kind of position, close to centers of power, but with a certain kind of intellectual marginality, the ancient Greeks thought that those were precisely the people to whom lawmaking and rule should most be trusted. They called such people, if you're interested, theoroi, theorists. Close to power, but marginal at the same time. So when you graduate, I hope you think of yourselves like that. In and among the powers, but not necessarily of them. As the potential makers of new laws and as the guardians of a special kind of knowledge. A special threatened kind of knowledge. And I hope you use that way of thinking about yourselves and thinking about your privilege to speak truthfully and act justly and love mercifully and walk humbly. Doing that is how you will really earn the Pomona education you lucked into, how you will really inhabit the space James Blaisdell wanted you to inhabit when he said that they only are loyal to this college who departing bear their added riches in trust for mankind. Yeah, like everybody else here, I want you to check your privilege while you're here. Um, but really, I want you to do something more than that. I want you to earn your privilege after you've left. Back when I was a legislative aide in the New Jersey General Assembly, such a great job, I had this awesome chief of staff, Adam Heater. Um, and one day, uh, he fielded a call from a constituent, um, and the constituent was angry. He was angry that he was being asked to pay taxes to support public education. Um, and he was even angry that, or that our assembly people, uh, the people for whom we worked, were supporting a bond to raise even more money for the public schools. Well, when this guy called, it had been a long day. Adam had fielded a lot of angry calls. So Adam, I don't know what it was. Maybe he had a drink at lunch. Maybe he was moved by the muse. Adam all of a sudden asked this caller, oh, that's really interesting, your position. Uh, did, you, did you go to public school? Yes, the caller said. OK, Adam said. Do you have a job? Uh, to which the man said, yes, you had a very good job and was very successful and had a lot of money that he did not want to pay in taxes. And Adam said, well, why don't you think of paying your taxes as paying the state back for the education you basically stole from the state and got from nothing at the time? <laughs> the man got really quiet and hung up. Those who <laughs> worked in politics know that never happened. It was a great moment. We were like high-fiving. <laughs> uh, what Adam asked that man to do is a version of what I'm asking you to do, or at least think about doing. Earn your privilege. So many of my former Pomona students um, are earning the privilege of their Pomona education every day. Um, I think of Susan Sparrow, class of 2008, one of my first students. Um, and Susan teaches eighth grade history um, at a private school in Tacoma, Washington. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Susan was told she needed a textbook uh, to teach to her class. 
and Susan couldn't find a textbook, a history textbook, that taught the content she wanted to teach in the way she thought it needed to be taught. So what did Susan Sparrow, a Pomona College graduate, do? She wrote and published her own textbook. You can find it on Amazon.com. It's called World History No One Gets Out Alive. <laughs> Jimmy Stake, um, also class of 2008, um, who, um, he was one of these guys who like knew from day one he was going to go to med school, he was going to be a neuroscientist, like everything, he was the one where all of his friends were like, I wish I were like Jimmy, Jimmy totally knows what he's going to do, I have no idea what I'm going to do, let's all be like Jimmy. So Jimmy knew what he wanted to do. Uh, but he went to med school and found that his elite medical school education was not in fact pointing him toward a life that would fulfill him or allow him to help others in the way he decided he really wanted to help them. Um, and so, quite bravely, I think he left. Um, he wrote me this morning from Santa Fe, um, where he's teaching, working to help kids on the reservation get access to college, doing some organic farming, and in his words, this is what he said, believing that the way forward is to make all of life a spiritual practice, living wholeheartedly with an attitude of inclusiveness and creativity. And I think of Rachel Hamburg, class of 2010, um, who when she was here, crafted a course in disability studies. Um, and then she went into the world and found that there were basically no, or at least not enough out nonprofits out there helping people with disabilities to really live fulfilling lives. So guess what Rachel Hamburg did? She started a nonprofit, Rosie's, to create jobs for people with developmental disabilities in Los Angeles County. Our graduates earning their privilege. Um, Susan and Jimmy and Rachel, so many more of our alums, are living examples of the fact that the liberal arts can be not only the foundation for having good jobs and doing good work, but also the foundation for good citizenship and good lives and all around goodness. Um, those sage hens are showing that the liberal arts is not just a kind of education, but a way of life, a way of moving through the world. Um, and I, not just as their professor, but as their fellow citizen, as their fellow human being, I'm really glad to know that they're out there. Sometimes when the world really gets me down, I think about people I know who I've taught, and I think I, uh, about what they're doing, and I think I feel better knowing that they're out there. My colleague at Williams, well, I, I should say he used to be my colleague at Pomona, then he betrayed me by leaving Pomona. Then he double betrayed me by going to Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid Williams. <laughs> He's smart enough, though, so I guess I'll quote him. My colleague at Williams, Justin Crow, um, is fond of saying that small liberal arts colleges don't aspire just to make better students. We aspire to make better people. And we aspire to make better citizens, too. Uh, I don't really need to tell you uh, that in a big, mass, impersonal, overwhelming, technological society like ours, in which most people don't feel like they can matter much at all, it's really hard um, to find and cultivate engaged citizens and independent-minded leaders. Uh, small liberal arts colleges are an exception to that rule. If we do one thing well, and if we do one thing well that other places don't do well, the Small Liberal Arts College is one of these few rare institutions in such a big and impersonal society that is really good at cultivating engaged citizens and independent-minded leaders. And it's not just because of what we do in class. Professors should never overstate the importance of professors. I can remember like one sentence from each of my classes in college. I can't even remember some of my classes in college. But I can remember entire conversations with my friends. I can remember entire nights. My memory is not the memory of the classroom, it's the memory of the people I was around. Um, it was a memory of that time, that place, that small time, that small place. Part of the reason, uh, in fact, that small liberal arts colleges uh, can, uh, in this big and personal society, be good at cultivating engaged citizens and independent-minded leaders is just because we're small. Uh, because we do things on a small scale and face-to-face -face and with great time and care. Um, here's a little speaking truth to Pomona Power. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I object to David Oxtoby's proposal that we raise the size of Pomona College. Our smallness matters. We can't scale up and still do the, the same things we do. Quantity changes quality. We do this cultivation 
simply by enclosing our students, by enclosing you, by enclosing all of us in small and close-knit communities where you do matter. Not as numbers, but as people. Here, you know you matter, uh, you know you matter, and that your actions matter to others. If for no other reason, then you learn pretty quickly here that your actions on any given Saturday night are going to be mattering to a lot of people on brunch at Sunday. <laughs> Sunday brunch. Uh, you don't really realize it while it's happening, but at schools like Pomona, you get habituated to mattering. Um, the hopeful idea is that then, when, when our students, when you go out into that big and often bad world, you will refuse to give up on acting like you matter to other people. Once you have the experience of mattering to other people, as so many have testified, it's not something you give up on easily. Given the choice, you are more likely to choose, having been here, to act like your actions matter and matter to other people. When my one-time Pomona colleague, the late David Foster Wallace, um, gave what has become his famous graduation speech at Kenyon College, he said this, Scrap all the cliches and the niceties about liberal arts education. We all know what they are. Breadth, blah, exposure, critical thinking, yada, yada, yada. He says, look, the really significant education in thinking that we're supposed to get in a place like this isn't really about the capacity to think, but rather about the choice of what to think about, he said. The choice of what to think about at every moment that you're living, whether you're stuck in traffic or in line at the supermarket or lying in bed at night, whether you've just been broken up with or whether you're in love, whether you've had children, whether someone close to you has died, every moment of your life, liberal arts education prepares you to have choices about how you think about what's happening. I submit, he told those graduates, that this is what the real no bullshit value of your liberal arts education is supposed to be about. How to keep going through your comfortable, prosperous, respectable adult, keep from going through your comfortable, prosperous, respectable adult life, dead, unconscious, a slave to your head, and to your natural default settings of being uniquely, completely, imperially alone day in and day out. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't you get to decide what to worship. Uh, he didn't mean in saying that, uh, that what we try to do here is religious, um, but he did mean that what we try to do here has a touch of the sacred. Well, uh, those of you who were paying attention, um, at least at the beginning of this lecture, I know it was a long time ago, uh, probably more of you are paying attention then than now, uh, those of you who are paying attention at the beginning of this lecture uh, will have noticed that I said, uh, I know of two last lectures that can rival that of Socrates, but then I mentioned only one. Uh, the third of the great last lectures is the one that I think in the end uh, is my favorite last lecture, uh, the last lecture that comes closest to what I would choose to worship. On April 3rd, 1968, at the Church of God in Christ headquarters in Memphis, Tennessee, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., sick with a cold, walked up to the pulpit and delivered what would be his last lecture. Dr. King got up in, the in front of the crowd, got up in the crowd that night and told them. He started by saying, well, if God Almighty came up to him and said, Martin Luther King, what age would you like to live in? That he would take mental flight through history stopping in Egypt to watch the exodus of the Israelites, stopping in ancient Greece to commune with Plato, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes, stopping in ancient Rome to watch the heyday of its empire, stopping in the Renaissance to appreciate its culture and aesthetics, stopping in Wittenberg to watch Martin Luther nail his theses to the church door, stopping in Washington, D.C. in 1863 to watch Abraham Lincoln agonize about and then ultimately decide to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, stopping in the 30s to hear the cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself, and sailing right into the mid-20th century to work for nonviolent civil revolution. Did you catch what he does there? He took the people in that room with him on an imaginary journey that is a liberal arts education in itself. What he had his listeners do, what he has his listeners do, is to imagine that they too have this view, the view from the mountaintop, the big view that comes from big study of big things, of things bigger and grander than our own narrow private interest. And then he says, once he has everyone imagining that we're seeing in this way, 
He said, let us turn to the world in front of us and struggle. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness, says King. Let us say, he says effectively, what we think to the powers that be. And these are King's words, what we are saying, he intoned, that we are determined to be men, we are determined to be people, we are saying, we are saying that we are God's children and that we are God's children. We don't have to live like we are forced to live. Well, he said, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. Of course, King didn't know the speech would be his last lecture. He knew there were threats on his life and specific threats on his life in Memphis, though that wasn't unusual. Um, he talked about those for a minute. He allowed that his life might be in jeopardy that night, the next day, any moment. And then he said, well, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Today, my beloved students, when you think about Pomona College, imagine a different picture of it than the one that says Pomona College is a bubble in which you're trapped. How about imagining that Pomona College puts you on the mountaintop, that Pomona College is the mountaintop, the place where you have access to that wide sweeping view and all those thinkers and books and places that King mentioned and a whole hell of a lot more. If you think about the picture of Pomona College that way, then, when you leave this place, when you come down from the mountaintop, try to bring the view with you. Try to remember the view. Try to protect the space and protect the view. How can you do that? Uh, as Josh Radner's character in the movie Liberal Arts learns to do, great movie, you should watch it, make the liberal arts a way of life. Read books. Read stories to your children, if you have them. Read stories to other people's children. Ask other people big questions. Engage strangers in serious conversations. Uh, take people, all people, seriously. <laughs> Pay attention, ask questions. Find and build community and don't, as Kurt Vonnegut once cautioned a graduating class at Agnes Scott College, try to make yourself an extended family out of ghosts on the internet. Go out and get a Harley and join the Hell's Angels instead. And do some struggling too. Struggle on behalf of the liberal arts. Struggle against the temptation when some snarky person jokes with you about your worthless liberal arts college degree. Struggle against the temptation to go along with that joke, that joke that is such a dangerous lie. Struggle against the temptation to believe the lie that says, oh, you're just in college now. Wait until you get into the real world. You're in the real world right now, people, and these are your real lives. Don't let other people demean them, now or ever, or any part of them. Struggle against the temptation to spend so much time looking at your resume that you forget to look for love, that you forget to look for transcendence, and friendship, and family, and fun, and trees. I like trees. Earn your privilege. Speak truth against the lies. Speak truth against the lies that chip away at the liberal arts. Speak truth against the lie that people who make the most money are the smartest or the best equipped to rule. Speak truth against the lie that if someone is rich, we should assume that person knows more about education than people who are poor. Or that they know more about education than people who are teachers. Speak truth against the lie that the only interest we have in other people's education is whether they become productive workers who add to the GDP. Speak truth against the big lie, that old lie, that perpetual lie that says the way things are or the way things have to be. Earn your privilege. There are powers in this age, ruthless and thoughtlessly presumptive, that are really in the end no different than those that dominated the ancient Athenian assembly. Uh, today, our ruthless and thoughtlessly presumptive powers have put the liberal arts on trial. Uh, Sometimes people like to say things like, well, in this society, we'd never you know, kill a Socrates. Um, but I think maybe things today are worse than they were in ancient Athens. The Athenians only put one Socrates to death. The powers of our day are trying to kill the whole enterprise of Socratic education. Uh, those same powers tell us, in this, 
perhaps the wealthiest nation in the history of human civilization, that we cannot afford to educate all our children well in a way that respects their equal dignity as human beings and their equal claim on human liberty. I really do believe that when the liberal arts are threatened, liberty itself is on the rack. We who are entrusted with the care of the liberal arts must know that we live in dark and anxious times. Um, but as Dr. King said that night in Memphis, I know somehow that when it is dark enough, you can see the stars. Well, for me, not to be too precious about it, there are a lot of stars in this room. My stars, my students at Pomona College. Try at least once grabbing the mic. You can do it. It's easy, just like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're cool. Thank you. I'm out. during that lecture. And just to clarify, for everyone in here, I think I can all speak to us, it's definitely an honor. We hope you never leave, and we are so lucky to be here with you. So, Professor McWilliams has also been so lucky to answer some questions. If you guys have some questions for her, uh, please speak loudly. Thank you. <laughs> That happens here, by the way. Them. A lot of people don't want to stay to teach things that aren't their research specialty. I love teaching right freshmen. To see uh, freshmen that haven't been corrupted by the institution. Yeah. <laughs> we take a joint to you. Be the deck and help us. Yeah. So we the right. I would just trust it to us to do it. Okay. Oh, there are all sorts of policies. Um, uh, and if it's I mean, most office, recently, oh, uh, uh, President Obama it has proposed uh, to remove uh, the tax benefits that would accrue to people who put money in a 529 to send their kids to college. Um, and he has reasons for doing that that are defensible reasons, uh, but he's effectively discouraging people from saving money to send their kids to college. Um, that's just something recent. Um, specific policies, uh, all sorts of things that the Gates Foundation are doing and proposing. Uh, there's excellent work on this by a guy named David Bosworth at the University of Washington. He says the Gates Foundation has just insane amount of money, way more money than Pomona College, um, and they impose a kind of vision, and often their experiments don't work, right? And they don't work at the expense of the students who are in that class. They're using students as guinea pigs, and their experiments fail, and then they keep doing the same thing. The Gates Foundation is dangerous. Um, uh, there are people on, uh, there are the people on the right 
who are critical of liberal arts education because they think you know we're cultivating hippie communist radical people. There are people on the left who are hostile to liberal arts education for different reasons. There are all sorts of different arguments they have marshaled. Um, uh, and lots of different policies out there, but pay attention to education policy, pay attention especially to what's going on in high schools. Um, one of the things that we talk about in Pomona a lot is like, wow, at a place like Pomona, we want to be able to like have an orchestra, right? Uh, it's nice to have an orchestra. It, you know, it, the music is elevating, students work together, students work with professors. Uh, well, it gets harder and harder for us to have an orchestra at Pomona College. Guess why? Because fewer and fewer students come to college knowing how to play an instrument. Um, and so if high schools um, are abolishing <coughs> arts programs and music programs, um, the liberal arts at the college level really suffer. Um, so pay attention, I say pay attention to education policy. I could almost guarantee you that everything being done in education policy right now is possible to small liberal arts college education. Um, and if you, uh, if you look for that, you'll start seeing it everywhere. why wouldn't we try to offer this kind of education to more and more people? Um, I agree with that, but I don't think the way to do it is to add to the size of the student body. We add to the size of the student body, we have to add to the size of the faculty. And the faculty here, it's really interesting, uh, to me anyway, it's about 200 people now. There's interesting sociological research that says once you get a group beyond 200 people, self-governance really becomes impossible. So from the faculty perspective, I say we start adding faculty lines, uh, you start, the faculty starts losing a lot of control over the institution, and that's really dangerous. You also have to add to the administrative bloat of this place, which is not much different than it is at other places. Um, I would prefer, if I had to make proposals in the same spirit to try to address the same problems, I would say Pomona College uh, should start its own prep school. Uh, Pomona College uh, should have a competition uh, among alums to have them found their own small liberal arts colleges um, or to have them found sites for education. I've argued we should use the internet. Now most of you, being Pomona College students, are from cities and suburbs. Um, we don't do a good job of reaching students in rural communities and isolated communities. Um, I'm often the only person in one of my classes who grew up in a small town near farms, right? If we really want to extend the reach of Pomona, why don't we use the internet? Um, and I'm no fan of the internet, as many of you know. Um, but here's a place where you could have seminars with Pomona professors and interested rural high school students. Um, there are all sorts of things we can do that don't risk compromising the core of what we do. I worry about David's proposal because I, I think it, it gets it's too close to the core of what we do. We also uh, you can tell that I haven't thought about this, like, ever. Uh, we also, in the Claremont Colleges, have this weird situation where we want to be small liberal arts colleges, and at the same time, you know, from the oh, but we have all the resources of a research university. Well, all the other Claremont Colleges are expanding, which is partly why sometimes people say, well, why shouldn't we expand, too? Um, but I think if the ambience of this place becomes less and less small, if the buildings become taller and taller and more and more corporate, um, the atmosphere of the place will change. We can't control what CMC does, God knows. We can't control <laughs> Pitzer. My husband teaches at Pitzer, like herding cats over there, right? But we can, I think, try to hold the line here and say there's something worth preserving in smallness. Once you ramp up, it's really hard to ramp back down. And so I think we should be very cautious about doing it and only do it if we feel like it's absolutely necessary for us to do. I think we should ask our students and our faculty and other people to come up with creative ways that we can bring a promoted education to more people without compromising the college. Um, well, sure, some of our money does. I was I was thinking more about small liberal arts colleges in general. Or oh, Farrell, the guy who wrote the article, he was okay, thinking so, about that. Right, so what, in, in your world, what would small liberal arts colleges be spending their money on for 
Uh, well, I, I mean, I think um, John Sear and I talk about this a little uh, in the book. I'm sorry he's not here. He's like really passionate um, on this particular point. So I'm going to channel my John Sear here. Or if I is that my theme. Um, so first, let's look at what you can cut. Um, uh, if you look at any accounting of the academy, um, administrative costs have skyrocketed. Um, the increasing cost of college education doesn't have to do with like overpaid teachers or increased, you know, increasing numbers of faculty. It has to do with administrative bloat. Um, the fact that we believe, for instance, through the power of Pomona College, that students can't run their own student groups, that you need like real grown-ups to manage things like the newspaper and like the club that sits around and, you know, I don't know, talks about the show Scandal, right? Like, you don't need other people to do that for you. And I think, um, and at, when I went to college, when I went to Amherst, we didn't have people doing that for us. And in some ways, that was much better training for being, you know, actual, like, functioning adults. Um, so I would think about some of those things. Um, how many things, you know, so I would pull back there. Um, I do think lots of other small liberal arts colleges, and I don't think of Pomona here, have done things like, and in your dorms you'll have hot tubs and jacuzzis, and like, I'm not making this up, there are schools with like, big like water slide, amusement park style like pools and stuff. Um, and it's, it's really a race to the bottom. Uh, those things could uh, certainly be cut. Um, John Seary has done all sorts of numbers about this, but uh, I think just sort of by cutting frivolousness, um, yeah. investing in uh, the core of the place. My colleague Jim Likens uh, is fond of saying uh, he's been here forever. <laughs> he once said, um, it was 2008, and it was the recession, and Gary Cates, who was then dean, got up and said, this was wildly horrifying to the faculty, okay, now when you take guests out to dinner, um, you can no longer pay for alcohol. Yeah, that will have to come out of your own pocket. Now, first of all, the faculty were horrified. We were like, but you pay for the student's beer. Some of us threatened, like, oh, next time I'm a guest speaker, I'm going to take him to pub, because that's where I can get the alcohol. But Gary Keats was saying this. The faculty was getting all. And you know, in retrospect, it was actually, I think, a nice symbol, saying, you know, we are going to cut back on frivolities. Jim <laughs> Likens got up in that conversation where we were all in a lather, because Pomona wasn't going to let us get drunk for free anymore. And he said, you know, Pomona College was a good school when it was a poor school. Um, and it would continue to be a good school if we were once again a poor school. We're really risk here thinking that what makes us good is the fact that we have a lot of money. We have to think about what really makes us good and it isn't dependent entirely on the money. It's a lot less dependent on the money than we think. Um, and, I, and I will never uh, be able to thank Jim Likens enough for saying that. Um, there are a few professors at Pomona increasingly who remember Pomona when it wasn't a rich. Princeton compared to Pomona. Well, like get down on your knees and thank whatever gods you pray to that you are not undergraduate at Princeton. Um, I mean, uh, uh, it was a great place to go to graduate school, but graduate school is, is a different business. Um, I worked uh, my last year in grad school. I was the what was called the. Me, the, mass, the assistant master of Wilson College, which is one of the residential uh, colleges. Mm -hmm. And I lived in the dorms, and especially in contrast to Pomona, what struck me at Princeton is how deeply unhappy and mean everyone was, and it came out when they were drinking. Like, okay, so I've lived near the campus here, and I've lived near the campus at Princeton. We used to live near the campus at Pomona. Like, there would be noise, there would be noise, would be like, Woo! I love you, I love you. And there'd be like people making out in the back lawn. It was like, I When I lived on the campus at Princeton, almost every night, um, uh, I would, you would hear people say, having conversations like, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> and there was no, you're cool. I mean, it was a place where I think people, um, uh, moreover, at Princeton, more formally, everything was hierarchy. 
right? You had to petition to get into majors. You had to petition to get into clubs. Don't even get me started about eating clubs, which uh, you know ostensibly were like, oh, anybody can join them. Well, if your father's a senator and you can spend an extra ten thousand dollars a year, right? And that was where social life was. I'll tell you one more Princeton story. So it's coming back. Um, at Princeton, basically, this is still true today, although they've tried to make it not the case. Social life entirely revolves around the eating clubs. So you want to get into one of the eating clubs, um, you know, whether you bicker them, that means pledge them, or you just get into one, one of the ones that's open. Um, but it, so you're a freshman, and you go to Princeton, and you go to parties at the eating clubs, because that's where parties are. And you talk to a member of the club, and then the member of the club says something to you like this. Uh, There's a great conversation. I'm going to go upstairs and write you an up card. Right? Which meant, uh, every time you as a freshman or sophomore went to a party, any time you went to a member of the club, they were explicitly evaluating me for future membership. And there were files. I saw some of the files. And I saw some of the books. Right? And how can that be conducive to developing a kind of community? How can that be con conducive to social trust when you know that everything you're doing is being measured and judged and usually judged pretty harshly? Um, I think it was a really mean place uh, to go. Uh, uh, I was close to somebody who was undergraduate there, um, I won't call her out because this is being taped, um, and she had all of the advantages that you could think you would need to have to be successful at Princeton. Pretty, smart, beautiful, really, really rich. And she hated it there. Um, she hated it there because it was uh, hard to find friends. Um, it was hard to know whether or not people would be nice to you uh, because they wanted to be nice to you or because they thought they could derive some advantage from you. It was really the culture of the place. When I came to Pomona, uh, one of the first things I said was, oh my gosh, they're so nice here. Um, and for that niceness alone, you should be glad that you come here. And I think that's actually distinctive of Pomona compared to Amherst too, which is where I went to undergrad. I think people are nice here. They want to be nice to each other. Thank you. Some of you will know it. Um, and it's, I think, a good parable for thinking about education when you're an educator of the sort uh, that we are here. Um, and, and Jesus says there, look, you know, if you're sort of planting seeds, right? You plant a lot of seeds. Um, some of them are going to take root and grow exactly like you wanted them. Um, some of them are going to kind of fall into a crack and, uh, you know, they, they'll never get a, get a chance. Some of them uh, are going to get crowded out. Some of them are not going to grow the way you wanted. Um, and the way I think about that parable is to say, look, not everybody you teach is going to turn out exactly the way you want them to. Um, if, if I wanted that, right, like I do a different kind of education, I want to enable people to choose, and they're not all going to turn out the way I want. Um, uh, but that's why I teach the way I teach. And the fact that not all people turn out and do jobs that I might think of as conducive to the common good, um, I guess I think just like if you're planting a field uh, and some of the plants don't turn out the way you want, you don't stop planting seeds, right? Um, you, consider, you continue to act to try to do the thing. You try to help people grow. It's not always going to work the way you want it to. Um, but that's OK. That's what liberty is about, um, that people have to choose for themselves in the end what kinds of lives they're going to lead. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for coming out. We're having another event, another last lecture event.